So you may remember this week we covered um, what the goings-on were back in 1957 when a previous Tory government had was a, had a pandemic and, well, things didn't turn out so well for them. And as I said, history tends to repeat itself. But I was very... Uh, e certainly took one line from that story which I think was very interesting. The fact that the back then, in 1957... There were far more left, uh, you know, left-facing newspapers than there are now. In fact, arguably, you can say that most of the newspapers in the UK, probably the only ones that are like out and out left, are the Guardian and the Independent. Those are the only two left. When back then it was, I think it was just like the Times. Um, I don't even think back then that the Telegraph was even full-blown Tory. I, I don't know. I, I'd have to think. But you've got to think over the years, like, The Sun has gone from, like, the working-class newspaper to we'll just spit on the working class whenever we get the chance. So there has been a lot of differences. And today we're going, once again, um, back to Australia because... This is something that when I've been talking to a couple of people I've known uh, through JCI, they are quite shocked at what's going on in the UK. And the last time I remember people being this shocked about what was going on in the UK was um, back when we had the big riots. Was it 2012, I want to say, when we had the big riots? And it, again, a lot of the people that I knew um, on the continent and further afield were quite shocked you know, they were like, this This doesn't happen in the UK, but there you go. So, back to the Sydney Morning Herald. And today's headline is uh, the biggest failure in a generation. Where did Britain go wrong? Health Secretary Matt Hancock was midway through a radio interview when the phone call came through live on air. On the line was the um, Insar Chowdhury, whose father Abdul had been made a, uh, uh, had made a prescient public plea to Boris Johnson in late March. Through Facebook, the 53-year-old consultant neurologist for a London hospital had urged the Prime Minister to make sure that every health worker in Britain would be given protective equipment during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, Abdul Mahmud uh, uh, Chaud Abud, Abud, Chowdhury died just three weeks later after contacting the disease. In this phone call, the doctor's grieving song asked for answers and an apology. The public is not expecting the government to handle this perfectly, he told Hancock. We just want you to openly acknowledge that there have been mistakes in handling the virus, especially to me and so many families who have already lost loved ones as a result of this virus and probably as a result of the government not handling this seriously enough. Chowdhury seemingly spoke on behalf of a growing chorus of health experts, MPs and members of the public who think Britain's response to this, who thinks Britain's response to this crisis has suffered from a series of deadly mistakes and miscalculations. The charges are on four key areas. That health workers struggle to access personal protective equipment. That Britain was too slow to implement a lockdown. Uh, that it bungled testing. <coughs> and that vulnerable care home residents were not properly protected. Downing Street and key ministers such as Hancock have been reluctant to concede many errors although their tone has shifted over recent days as the official death toll has hit 28,000, one of the highest in the world, and well above the 20,000 figure Chief Scientific Advisor Patrick Vance once said the government hope not to exceed. Uh, says Martin McKee, the Professor for European Public Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and an advisor to the World Health Organization, said... But the countries that have moved fast have curtailed the epidemic. The countries that, de that delayed have not. It's as simple as that. Dr. Richard Horton, editor-in-chief of the Lancet Medical Journal, is even more damning. 
The handling of the COVID-19 crisis in the UK is the most serious science policy failure in a generation. Hancock and Johnson had their first discussions together about the virus on January the 7th. The government's crisis committee, COBRA, would meet several times over the following weeks and the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, that's SAGE, started crunching the numbers. The government knew the exact threat that, 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 knew that a threat existed, but did not fully understand just how bad it could get. By March 12th, a full-scale outbreak had taken hold in Italy, and the illness was spreading across Europe. More than a thousand Italians had already died and thousands more were gravely ill packed in hospitals in the country's hard-hit north. The deadly potential of an invisible killer was becoming more obvious by the hour. That day Johnson announced Britain would move from the contain phase of the emergency to the delay phase. This decision would prove a pivotal moment. The shift meant a uh, contr- uh, contact tracing would be abandoned and testing would be restricted to those only in hospital with symptoms. The move was at odds with the uh, the WHO who urged countries to test, test, test as well as Germany's much lauded program of mass testing. The Prime Minister warned at the March 12 press conference that the worst public health crisis for a generation was about to hit the country and that more uh, that many more families are going to lose loved ones before their time. What he did not announce was a lockdown or anything close to it. Tougher measures would would come, but not yet. Johnson said citing the need to introduce measures when they would ha- when they would have the most impact but his chief scientific advisor also cast serious doubts on whether closing schools, banning mass gatherings, or stopping international flights would even be effective. Uh, Sorry, even be effective leaders, leaders to pull. Instead, Brits were encouraged to wash their hands and stay at home for several days if they had symptoms. Schools remained open, restaurants, bars, and uh, bars traded as usual, and visitors were still allowed into care homes. Flights were arriving from mainland China, even though Australia had banned them six weeks earlier. Having public events was still allowed. A Champions League match in Liverpool drew a crowd of over 52,000, and about 3,000 of those came from Madrid, where a partial lockdown was already in force. More than uh, uh, 250,000 tickets were sold for the Cheltenham Racing Horse Festival. Both events are now being investigated by health officials who suspect that they may have contributed to the rapid spread of the disease in the surrounding areas uh, because of the venues. By March 16th, the government's advice abruptly strengthened. People were told to stay at, ho- to stay at home and away from pubs, theatres and clubs to avoid non-essential travel and to work from home if possible, although the, uh, the orders were not yet mandatory. So why the sudden change? The government had just been handed a bombshell piece of research by scientists from Imperial College London, warning that taking a light touch approach to the virus would cause 250,000 deaths in Britain and overwhelm the National Health Service. Any hope for for defeating the virus by uh, building the herd immunity in the community was smashed. The only way to prevent uh, uh, 250,000 deaths was through draconian measures and researchers researchers concluded. Even then, Johnson would not put Britain into lockdown until one week later on March 23rd. By that point, many other European countries with similar, with much smaller death toll had already been locked down. David Hunter, an Australian um, educated professor of epidemiology and medicine at the University of Oxford said, It's easy in hindsight to state the obvious, which is that the lockdown came too late. The British response is uh, is so far is not a model to follow. It is one of the worst epidemics in in Europe and the world that may have happened anyway. There's no way for us to know to sure, but some aspects of the response have almost certainly contributed to the high mortality rate. A former Australian High Commissioner to Britain, Mike Wren, says that crucial mistakes were made right when they had the most damaging impact. The earlier stages were handled uh, uh, neglectingly, says Wren. A shambles of mixed messaging, poor organisation and complacent attitude 
uh, that is what happened. Uh, that what, that what was happening in Italy. It wouldn't. It shouldn't and wouldn't have. Shouldn't and wouldn't have happened here. Hunter says that the border closes in Australia and New Zealand stood in stark contrast to Britain, which only briefly imposed restrictions on people flying in from Wuhan. Even today, few passengers still alive in Britain are under no obligation to self-isolate. Good public health practice would be would, would be to, if not to close the borders, then at least have some sort of mandatory self-isolation for people coming in during the very early stages of the pandemic, Hunter says. The reason why the UK did not do it are unclear. Australia, albeit in a different stage of the epidemic, has been highly successful in closing the border, as has New Zealand. And that has almost certainly played a role in the much, much lower case of numbers. In the, sorry, in the much lower uh, number of cases. Arrivals at Heathrow Airport were cut by half from what they normally were in March, but still, 3.1 million landed over, landed there over the month. Nearly a million more came from the Asia Pacific area. 87, uh, 875,000 were from the European Union, and seven, uh, 711 came from North America. Home Secretary Priti Patel supported a ban on travellers. Uh, who had been in hotspots, but was slapped down by Downing Street when it cited scientific evidence that doing so would have little impact on the spread of the infection. When this spat was underway, Australia's borders had already been closed for a week to all foreign, tra all foreign travellers. Australia banned flights from China as early as the 1st of February. The decision on March 12th to abandon mass testing meant the government could only guess who was infected with the virus and how it was behaving. Government experts at one point estimated as many as 55,000 people had contracted the virus, even though there were just 2,000 confirmed cases. The extent of its spread would not become obvious until hospitals started to fill with seriously ill patients. On the few tests that were available, the results were initially processed by a small number of government-run laborator laboratories. Private secretary labs and universities offered to help, but now say they were given the cold shoulder before the government eventually embraced them as, uh, as an answer to ramping up testing. Nobel Prize winning scientist Sir Paul Nurse told BBC's Question Time programme that testing was absolutely critical and it hadn't been handled proper properly. We know that with this particular disease you, uh, you can be infected and have no symptoms. Now this makes absolutely no sense. Why are we allowing, potentially, for frontline workers to be on the wards, potentially infecting people because we weren't testing? Nurses, uh, uh, who is, oh, nurse, who is the director of Britain's largest biochemical research lab, the, the, Francis, uh, the Francis Click Institute, likens the addition of private facilities to the flotilla of small boats that rescued British soldiers from the beaches of Dunkirk and says that the call-up was long overdue. One of the strongest critics of the testing system has been Jeremy Hunt, the health secretary under former Prime Ministers David Cameron and Theresa May. Piers Morgan, a polarising, I love that, a polarising morning television presenter and former tabloid newspaper editor, reportedly mauled government ministers on his, government, on his Good Morning Britain programme about the deficiencies. Under pressure, Hancock announced a plan to lift a number of, uh, a plan to lift the number of tests conducted each day to 100,000 by the end of April. He achieved it, but sort of. The government reported 122,000 tests on the 30th of April. The devil, however, is always in the detail, though. About only 4,000 were tests mailed to people, but not actually yet returned for labs for results. Regardless, Hancock's ambitious goal has transformed Britain's approach to testing, and if sustained, it could make it one of the world's most prolific testers. The government is also hiring 18,000 contract tracers by the middle of May. Despite the recent surge, those early delays mean that Britain has conducted just 10.13 just 10, uh, just 10 tests per 1,000 people, the lowest rate in Western Europe. Italy's rate is 32 point, is 32%, Ireland's is 31 Germany's is 30%. Australia's testing effort has also been doubled, 
ding bing ding double the relative size of Britons, despite having a far less serious outbreak. And for all the criticism of the US response to the crisis, the rate of testing there never fell below the rate of Britain in April. In his first address from Downing Street after his own battle with the virus, Johnson said that the government was determining to fix the ch determined to fix the challenges that had been so knotty and infuriating. I'm not going to minimise the logistical problems we have faced in getting the right protective gear to the right people at the right time, both in the NHS and in care homes. Our frustrations are that we have experienced in expanding the number of tests. The additional testing capacity has allowed the government to get a better grip on the unfolding toll in Britain's care homes. It was previously flying blind. Only three weeks ago, even symptomatic care home residents and staff did not qualify for a test. For many weeks, patients were discharged from hospitals and into care homes without being tested to check whether they would have been taking a deadly virus into a place where it could unleash havoc. The Office for, the, the office for National Statistics, which... Uh, compiles uh, death data based on whether COVID-19 was mentioned on death certificates, believes that over 4,000 care home residents died in England alone in the fortnight ending between the 24th of April. In the week ending to April 17th, about 17,000 people died in care homes from all causes. This was about 2,000 or, or more deaths so than the week before, and that almost doubled the week before that. Care home deaths were not added to Britain's official death toll until late last week, and the true extent of the loss is still unclear. In early March, Johnson and his team spoke of shielding care home residents during the worst of the epidemic. They have since failed, but they are not alone. All badly affected countries in Europe have experienced a wave of deaths in, ca waves of deaths in care homes. While the Prime Minister has enjoyed a sharp rise in his approval ratings since the outbreak began, Polling from Ipsos and Mori has recorded a significant rise in the number of people who think that the government acted too late. Two weeks ago, 57% of people felt that they uh, uh, felt that way, but that figure now stands at 66%. Johnson and Hancock have been, uh, have been keen to stress that Britain has passed through the peak of the virus without the NHS being overwhelmed pointing to a massive and rapid expansion in capacity and the early purchase of thousands of ventilators. Chief Medical Officer Chris Whiteley says that the only way to truly compare Britain's response will be once the pandemic has run its course, not just uh, in Britain, but in the other countries that may yet experience serious outbreaks. We are nowhere near the end of this epidemic. There is a long way to go uh, to run for every country in the world on this, and I think that's not going to change to who's won and who's lost. And there you have it. Probably one of the most honest um, reportings of what is happening in this, in this country at the moment. And it's coming from a foreign newspaper. Now, we could have gone to The Guardian or The Independent. But I just want to really point out here. Any other newspaper... Um, just this Monday, they were all whooping and cheering at the fact that there's going to be uh, lockdown restrictions going to be lifted. How can you lift these lockdown restrictions when A, you still haven't got enough mass testing in place. Yes, it's in place and it's still going ahead quite well, which is good. But we're now having to ha get these uh, tracers in place. These are some of the things that if you remember we were talking about back at the beginning of March so still the government is it's running a race but it's decided that rather than running it it's going to hop on one leg so it's running the most it's running the race in the most inefficient way it possibly can and i generally do hope that all the end of this that we get a public inquiry just into what the hell our government's been doing. Um, we still don't know who's on stage. There's still a lot of reportings that Dominic Cummings might have been heavily involved in it, and that he, for political reasons, um, mainly to stop Brexit, may, well, not stop Brexit, but make sure that Brexit continues, may have been um, involved in those ways in some shape or form. 
And once again, I'm going to shrug my shoulders and just go, what the hell's going on in our country? Because at one time, we used to be quite good. And I'll tell you what, it all started going to pot when the Tories came into power.